So with Critical Role making a brief return for Campaign 2 to wrap up the Ukatoa arc, I thought it would be a good idea to cover everything we know so far about this great Leviathan, Ukatoa, and Critical Role. As always, if you enjoy the video and learn something new, make sure you like, comment, and subscribe. Don't forget to check out some of our other Critical Role and lore content. Let's just get right into it, shall we? Oh yeah, and obviously, uh, this video is going to contain some spoilers for many aspects of Critical Role Media, so consider yourself warned. Now, before we talk about Ukatoa and its role in the story of Campaign 2, we need to travel back in time a bit to the founding. That's right, it's time for a little Critical Role history lesson. <laughs> So the world of Exandria is divided into a few time periods, which can roughly be split into the Founding, the Schism, the Age of Arcanum, the Calamity, and Post-Calamity, which is the era in which our campaigns take place in. For a more in-depth rundown on these ages, make sure you check out our other YouTube videos, but for this, we're just going to go through them relatively quickly. Founding was considered the first age of Exandria, where the gods came to this world and brought forth life and creatures to inhabit this planet. At this point, the gods were kind of as one a bit in their vision, and if we are to believe as Modeus, they viewed each other in a kind of familial Sense. At some point in this age, a war would break out against two factions, one being the Primordials, great elemental beings who inhabited Exandria long before the gods ever arrived here and were believed to have risen up against the gods after the gods granted mortal beings access to divine magic. You see, at the time of the founding in this age, it was very dangerous for mortals to live upon Exandria, so many of the gods feeling bad watching their creations die and suffer, decided to invest into them divine magic. For the Primordials, this act upset the balance of this world that they had existed to long before these gods and these mortals ever came here. And so, in retaliation, began wreaking chaos on the mortals of Exandria. Their allies in this war would come to be known as the Betrayer Gods, a group of gods who allied themselves with this Primordial in the War of the Schism. Or suggests many of these gods believed as well that the balance of power had been upset and that it was better to let the world burn and begin anew, while others simply wanted to plunge the world into chaos. This faction would fight against the prime deities, those gods who would fight back, ultimately victoriously, with the mortals against their betrayer brethren and the primordials. The primordials would be destroyed and the betrayer gods banished to other planes. Oh yeah, and apparently at some point in here, there were two other mystery gods who just vanished, probably stuck in the red moon of Ruidus. But hey, at the time of recording, we just have no idea. After this, the world entered into a much more peaceful time known as the Age of Arcanum, where the use of arcane magic would give rise to a glorious age of progress. This would come to a halt, though, when the Archmage Vespin Chloras, attempting the Matron's ritual to ascend to godhood, would bind himself to the Betrayer God Asmodeus, becoming his thrall, eventually releasing these Betrayer Gods back into the world in a grand war which would cost the lives of two-thirds Exandria, known as the Calamity. For more details on this whole story of Vespin Koras in the beginning of the Calamity, make sure you watch EXU Calamity. Here is where the story of our great Leviathan, the wormy boy, Ukatoa, is born. Ukatoa, you see, was a creation of one of the Betrayer Gods, the Heer, the Cloaked Serpent. The Heer, you see, is not a nice guy. He's the god of assassins, poison, snakes, yanti, and sowing chaos. Zaheer is particularly nasty betrayer god, and is not only hated by many of the prime deities, but some of his fellow betrayer gods as well, as Loth and Torog encourage their followers to actively hunt those of Zaheer's. At some point early on in the Calamity, Zaheer created Ukatoa, a great leviathan or massive serpent with three eyes as well as a series of eyes that run down along its body. It's presumed Zaheer created Ukatoa as an agent of chaos or as a weapon of war to be unleashed upon the oceans of Exandria, but little information is known for sure regarding his motivation. At some point during the Calamity, Zaheer would be captured and banished from Exandria to an unknown realm. Ukatoa then, masterless and unleashed upon the Lucidian Ocean, began to fancy itself as a god and demanded all of those who entered into its domain to worship him instead. 
For almost 500 years post calamity, Ukatoa would rule this ocean, killing men but gaining many followers. The already immensely powerful Leviathan growing stronger with the number of his worshippers gaining. The Leviathan would grant many of these followers powerful magic, allowing them to crush their foes in battle. However, the dwindling followers of Zaheer post calamity, many of whom had been purged by the followers of Melora, as well as hunted, like we said, by those of Lolf and Torog, were angered by this flagrant disobedience to their god and the serpent's master and creator. They felt Ukatoa's ascension to a minor idol in demanding of all people to worship him a great slight against the creator. So 500 years post-Calamity, a group of cultists of Zakir began destroying and corrupting temples to Ukatoa. And they somehow managed to seal this great leviathan deep beneath the ocean floor, this prison contained by three seals. Scattered across the ocean were the three accompanying keys, strange eye-like orbs known as cloven crystals. During Campaign 2, the Mighty Nine encountered an ancient mural depicting Ukatoa with two other kaiju-like entities, a large bird, which is the Phoenix Deserat, which was the mount of the betrayer god Asmodeus, and a great toothy worm, which is named Quajath? I really hope that's how you pronounce that. A great telepathic worm which was created by Torog in the Calamity. It is believed that these three minor idols have a pact with one another. Should any one of them escape or be released upon Exandria, they will then help the others escape. Deserat was captured in prison beneath Mount Mentiri during the Calamity, where it currently still resides. While Quajath was thought destroyed in the Calamity, but somehow managed to survive and regenerate itself deep beneath the ice of Isocross. However, once it fully regrew, it found that it could not break through this thick ice, so it still resides there this day. So, then you see, the stakes for the release of Ukatoa are pretty high, as not only would Ukatoa bring chaos and death to Exandria, through its own actions, but if it manages to release its kaiju allies, especially one so closely linked with Asmodeus, yeah, you could see how there would be uh, big, big problems. Hundreds of years later in 823, an elven pirate, Avantika, would begin sailing with a man named Vandrin. Vandrin at some point had learned about this great serpent, Ukatoa, and the power that it once brought to people. Vandrin, wanting this power, slain the owner of a former cloven crystal, the eye-like orb, which are the keys to Ukatoa's prison. Vandrin would then make a pact with Ukatoa, one to gain power from this serpent in exchange for attempting to free it, Vandrin then absorbing this orb into his chest. Vandrin would tell Avantika everything he knew about the Great Serpent, the woman becoming a zealot for this lesser idol. Her and Vandrin would plan on sailing to the island of Urukaxel, where one of the seals was located, but the two would never make it there, Vandrin eventually growing cold feet about his cause and disappearing. Avantika would attempt to hunt the man down, wanting to kill him and claim his crystal, but she could never find him. Eventually, though, she would claim a crystal of her own. As unbeknownst to her, Vandrin would auction off his crystal in Port Damali. Avantika would murder the buyer, absorbing the crystal in her palm. Vandrin would use the money to buy a ship, the Tide's Breath, in which one of the sailors he would hire would become member of the Mighty Nine, Ford Stone. Ford and Vandrin would grow close, Ford rising to first mate, viewing Vandrin as a father figure. At some point, though, the ship would be sabotaged with explosives by Ford's childhood friend Sabian. The boat would explode at sea, Ford being tossed into the water. Drowning, the half-orc would subconsciously make a pact with Ukatoa to avoid death, Ford waking up on the shore of Bisaft Isle, having no memory of this pact, but having gained strong magical powers as well as a strange falchion blade. Time would pass, Ford himself beginning adventuring with the group the Mighty Nine. One night after resting from travel, Ford would have a strange vision or a dream of a strange yellow eye. He would wake up coughing seawater, and to his surprise, he found that his falchion had vanished. Concentrating on the blade, though, Ford realized he could summon it at will into his hand. While adventuring, the party would stumble upon a strange waterlogged cave being inhabited by a group of Lokath or fish people. After feeding these fish people, Ford could hear the call of the strange voice of Ukatoa in his vision coming from another tunnel. He would follow it, finding a strange yellow ball, a cloven crystal. Upon touching it, Ford would go cold, blacking out, as he is sent into a vision. Ford would see a vision of a younger Vandrin absorbing a crystal like this 
into his chest. Once Ford comes to, though, and regains consciousness, the crystal is gone, the rest of the party telling him they watched him absorb the crystal into his chest. Ford would continue to receive visions from Ukatoa with a promise of a reward, as upon absorbing the crystal, his pact with Ukatoa has grown stronger, giving him more power. Ukatoa wanting Ford to break the seals, holding Ukatoa captive and offering him power in exchange for this. The party would travel to Nicodronis, or discovering information on a group of pirates who were paid by Avantika to find a said orb. The Mighty Nine would steal a ship, setting out as pirates to the pirate island of Darkto, where it is said Avantika lives, Ford wanting to find new answers about his powers. As the party neared this pirate island, though, they would be intercepted by Avantika's ship. She would question them. Ford would reveal to the group that he knew where the orb that she was searching for was. Vantika would offer them two options. One, work for her or die. I guess we work for the pretty pilot lady now. Vantika would then reveal to the Mighty Nine that she is the chosen follower of Ukatoa. Together with Vantika, the group would travel to the island of Urukaxel where Vantika would unlock one of these serpent seals. At this point, Ford and the party we're beginning to grow very wary of Avantika and her mission to free Ukatoa, unleashing this deadly serpent upon the world. Eventually, the two groups coming to blows. They would leave this pirate island of Darktoe, Ford having a vision of where the third crystal resided in the wreckage of the tide's breath. They would journey there, defeating a sea fury and claiming this crystal. Party would journey to the second seal of Ukatoa, Ford explaining that he did not want to release the serpent but wanted to gain more. Power. Ford would insert the crystal into the seal, receiving a vision of the location of the third and gaining the ability to control water. Ukatoa now only having one seal, keeping this great leviathan trapped beneath the ocean. From here, the party would continue their adventures elsewhere across Wildmount, Ford receiving violent visions of Ukatoa uttering the word punishment, as Ukatoa would repeatedly remove Ford's powers. After a vision with the Wild Mother, Ford decided to attempt to rid himself of Ukatoa, tossing the, his falchion blade into a lake of lava. As the sword sank into the lava, being presumably destroyed, Ford's pact was broken. Much time would pass, Ford continue his worship to the Wild Mother and gaining the vestige Star Razor. Ford would be awoken from a dream with a dagger in his chest from an Ukatoa assassin. After being revived, Ford would realize that the orb was still inside his chest. See, Ford has not followed up on his end of the bargain, so Ukatoa, being obviously pissed off and being so close to being released, began to send his followers after Ford to reclaim this crystal. Later, the party would be attacked again by servants of Ukatoa and an undead Avantika, who would dispel this amber necklace, releasing the crystal, claiming it, attempting to teleport away with it. Ford would pursue her, though, striking her down, causing the Star Razor to become exalted and revealing itself as a vestige, and then regaining this crystal. It's unclear, though, what Ford's exact plans are for the crystal post-campaign 2. It's believed he still carries it with him, Though, he has considered giving it to the Cobalt Soul for safekeeping, something that he probably should have already done by now. First, though, he wants to investigate the Third Temple. Though his ship, the Nine's Heroes, suffers consistent attacks from minions of Ukatoa post-Campaign 2. It's unknown still what Ford's plans are really here with the Crystal and Ukatoa, and... This has been unchanged since the beginning of Campaign 2. Ford always kind of flirted a line here, which is something I love about Warlocks, especially when you got some not-so-nice patrons wanting the power but not wanting the ultimate consequences that come, you know, with the patron and releasing it to the world. This is really everything we know about Ukatoa so far in Critical Role in the events of Campaign 2. If you managed to make it through all of this video, then pat yourself on the back for me. I'm very excited to see what Matt has in store for us in this kind of mini wrap-up arc of Campaign 2 and the return of Campaign 2. It's projected to just be a short little episode thing, which I would imagine would you know, come in the form of either destroying the crystal, possibly even fighting Ukatoa, probably not though. But I wondered though, just what 
is in store for us and what would happen if somehow things go awry and Ukatoa gets released upon the world of Critical Role shortly after Campaign 2. As we said, there are huge stakes here as if Ukatoa is released, it will most likely release its other two kaiju brethren, one being the servant of as Modeus, basically bringing chaos and destruction onto the world as these three lesser idols, while not full-fledged gods, still are incredibly powerful and the divine gate prevents any of the gods from coming in and dealing it. So it would be basically up to uh, uh, those immortals upon Exandria to stop this whole Biz going down. Curious to see exactly what's going to happen. Excited to see uh, our characters of the Mighty Nine return again. Let me know in the comments down below what are your predictions and projections for this return of uh, campaign two. What are your thoughts on Ukatoa? Was there any other Ukatoa information I left? Please let me know in the comments down below. And as always, guys, I hope to see you in the next one. Thank you so much for watching my video. Stay safe out there. Peace. Love. Adieu.